Hello, everyone. I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome to Boosting Europe's Green Transition at the World Economic Forum Davos Agenda. My name is Sarah Kelly. I am thrilled to moderate this session. The central question today is how to boost Europe's green transition. We'll get a check on the implementation of the European Green Deal and the private sector's contribution to what is one of the world's most ambitious plans for unlocking long-term growth and prosperity. Now, the World Economic Forum's CEO Action Group for the European Green Deal is working to accelerate the green transition through private sector action. We're going to be hearing a lot more about that and um, some details on those initiatives over the next hour. It's my honor to introduce our distinguished speakers. Franz Timmermans is Executive President, Executive Vice President for the European Green Deal at the European Commission. Teresa Rivera is Deputy Prime Minister and Minister for the Ecological Transition of Spain. Liam Condon is President at Bayer Crop Science. And Esther Bijet is President and CEO of Novozymes. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us. And we're just waiting on the Executive Vice President uh, to join us. Um, I'd like to begin with Deputy Prime Minister Teresa Rivera and ask you um, about your experiences, because you really know how to bring international parties together. You organized COP25. You were one of the architects of the Paris Climate Accord. Um, Spain, of course, has been one of the worst hit economies in the EU by the pandemic. Through that lens, tell us a little bit more about the action plan when it comes to implementing the recovery package and the policy foundation that you are laying in Spain, and maybe some of the opportunities for the private sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, for this uh, nice question. And uh, um, hello, everybody. I'm very happy to join this, uh, this very interesting panel. I think that uh, very precisely what we need to do is to ensure that any single cent is properly invested in order to uh, create the transformation we need to accelerate. So the recovery is perceived uh, like an opportunity in Spain to change, to shift the future that uh, we needed to to build in any case. So at least 40% of um, the total public uh, spending will be addressing uh, climate concerns, both mitigation and building adaptation and resilience. And as uh, it was stated from the commission since the very beginning, uh, the whole package will be uh, under the principle of no harm. So everything needs to be consistent. It's not just a question of uh, investing uh, some part of the money to do what we need to do and we forget about the rest. It is that everything needs to be consistent. And then we need to identify what are the drivers that um, can, um, can facilitate um, uh, the acceleration of uh, others investing their money in the right uh, direction. This is why we paid much attention around the energy transition, the energy transformation in the different uh, pieces of the transformation that we need to, 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 to do. So boosting energy efficiency, both at the buildings and infrastructure sector, but also in terms of uh, industry need to be prepared to, to be much more efficient and uh, to work on some other pieces which are a little bit more innovative. We in Spain think that we need to combine the full renewable energy system with uh, a much more sound storage system. And this will be very interesting in terms of industrial opportunities, but also in terms of addressing the market regulation and the market opportunities, market mechanism to play this uh, properly within the, the transformation. And a um, couple of additional things that um, I guess are quite important. One of them, taking the... Um, the uh, Industry connected to the transformation, so the mobility piece, uh, for instance, thinking in terms of the whole value chain, both industrial and services, and not just counting on clean air or clean energy, but also the industrial pieces of the value chain and the services connected to this value chain, and the green finance, uh, going beyond green bonds, but addressing these uh, aspects as um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the people working on 
green uh, taxonomy, as uh, I'm sure that Thomas will be <laughs> commenting later on, how far we can be consistent to address and to send the right signals in terms of value and cost, without forgetting a very final and important comment, the green and blue agenda, nature-based solutions in order to face the um, challenges in terms of uh, resilience and adaptation. And as you implement that on the public side, um, it's also important to highlight and one of the you know, main um, goals of this session is the fact that there are uh, financing gaps, of course, um, and that the commission ha has really you know, drawn the line out and, and called on the private sector to fill some of those. With that, I'd like to turn to you, Liam, um, because we know that the food supply chain is estimated to contribute um, to about a quarter of global emissions. Agriculture is, of course, a really big part of that. Um, so there's a lot of potential here um, for decarbonization in that area to be a real game changer. To that end, you're leading one of the CEO Action Group's most promising initiatives in terms of impact and scope. So if you could first tell us a little bit more about that initiative, about the CEO Action Group, um, and what you hope to achieve in what is known as a Lighthouse Project. Sure. Th thanks a lot, Sarah. And it's great to be with you all on, on, on this panel. Um, so the CEO Action Group uh, was actually born from some criticism uh, at the World uh, Economic Forum that we were spending too much time talking and not spending enough time on really driving progress through coalitions and, and uh, uh, basically multi-stakeholder approaches to really uh, find more systemic solutions to the big challenges that we're facing today. Um, in this specific, and, and there's a few examples um, of what the CEO Action Group is working on. Um, one, as you've mentioned, and, and the one that I'm uh, most uh, closely connected with, with, with a variety of other CEOs and, and very forward thinking companies, is the whole topic of decarbonizing the food system. As you rightly say, um, agriculture and food is today a big part of the, the, the challenge of climate change. But agriculture is one of the few industries in the world where you have the possibility to actually sequester carbon, not just reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but actually sequester carbon. So we can actually, if we do agriculture in the right way, we can actually make agriculture and the food system part of the solution to climate change. So against that background, uh, what we've done is, is um, uh, basically set up uh, a European uh, carbon farming coalition um, multitude of companies involved, companies like Swiss Re, Zurich, to, to fill that financing gap, as you said, um, um, seeds and crop protection companies like ourselves, Bayer, um, Syngenta, but also big food companies like Nestle, Novazymes is also involved, um, satellite imagery companies um, uh, like Planet Labs, um, companies like DSM, so a variety of companies all working together we're basically trying to figure out three things. One is um, we've got to get in place a, an, a carbon accounting methodology for agriculture. This doesn't exist today. A standardized approach just doesn't exist today. And we've got to help develop this approach because that's the only way that we can actually track that we're making progress. Second thing is uh, we've got to get incentivization of farmers right. Everybody wants farmers to pay more attention to the environment. Farmers live off the environment. Everybody wants them to look after biodiversity in, in a better manner. But initially, this might cause additional costs in, in the short term for farmers um, and additional risk. So we need to make sure that they're incentivized to be part of this solution and, and not that they're left on the margins and left carrying only the costs. And the third part is we need to educate and better educate consumers about the climate footprint of their food choices. I think if everybody knew what the climate footprint was of their food choices, like they know about nutritional labeling, labeling or calories, they would take much more informed choices. So this is what the, the coalition is going to work on. We've only got nine harvests left until 2030. So we really got to move fast. And I know there's a, a ton of companies out there, um, uh, NGOs, academia. We got to get a much bigger coalition going to have a really systemic impact. So that's my final appeal. Come on board. Uh, let's do this together. <laughs> it's a tremendous opportunity. 
nine harvests left um, and a unique opportunity for, um, you know, other stakeholders and actors to potentially get involved in your lighthouse project, which is called decarbonizing the food chain, um, we have to mention. Um, Esther, I'd like to turn to you uh, because Liam just also mentioned your company, uh, which is a biotech <laughs> focusing on industrial enzymes. Um, you are you have this pioneering technology that is essential, really, to a green future. The, Europe, uh, the Commission has also acknowledged um, just how key this technology is um, to 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 accelerating the transition and 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 bringing the goals forward. Explain to us why this work is so important and how it can boost. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah, for this beautiful introduction. Very little to add uh, from, uh, from my side, but especially thank you and to WEF uh, for driving initiatives like today and for hosting us uh, in the panel. It, the, the green transition, as, as you said, it's, it's dear to our core values. It's dear to our purpose, to, to our mission, to whom we are. We are a world leading a biotech company, not only enzymes, but everything that biotechnology embraces, including microorganisms. And we use the biotechnology to provide responses, to bring answers to the society's most pressing needs. That means solutions that they help to reduce energy. That means solutions that they lead to lower waste production. That means solutions that they lead to raw, lower raw material consumption or that they enable a healthier solutions for the consumers, lower food waste. So across the whole uh, value chain. And for sure, we welcome uh, the EU Commission's Green Deal. It's uh, the, the Green Deal, it's not only a solid path for transforming the um, green economy, but it's also the EU to a greener economy, but it's also a holistic invitation for our companies, for all the companies to step up and to step in. So having said that, let me, let me answer, then go back into your, into your question and uh, looking at the challenges that the society and the statement that you make that there is no question that biotechnology is part of the solution. So what we companies can do, biotech companies can do to make the transition faster. It's a very simple answer. One of them is we just have to do what we set for, for our just deliver, just continue to bring in innovation, continue to bring in solutions that will make both small in steps to uh, reaching our target, but also breakthrough uh, solutions that will move us closer to our aim. I can confidently say that the toolbox, then the capabilities are here, uh, that the, 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 bio, the potential for biological or for biotech, it's also uh, much, much broader than what, we, what we're seeing at this moment. And also as, Tim mentioned, as, as it was mentioned by Liam, we cannot do this alone. We must have the dialogue and we must have the uh, cooperation with the right political pool to accelerate that implementation to innovation. I think it was Teresa uh, who said that it's about consistency and mm -hmm. we can only move as fast as our slowest part. And looking at that consistency, if you think on uh, whom are we and uh, the world that we live, we live in a world which is uh, based on a trillion dollar fossil infrastructure. And it's also based on a trillion dollar fossil economy. That's okay. It's logical. It's, it, it's for a good reason. It's our history. It's our past. But it cannot be our future. And that means this world that uh, for biotech and bio solutions, they face with the standards. They face with challenge. They face with regulations data demands, tests, assessments, that they are based on the fossil and the chemical paradigm. That means that solutions, that they are environmental friendly solutions, they need to go to the same regulations that were developed to deal with very high risk chemicals. And, and what that means, for no reason, for no upside for the world, it leads to a delay. So we- Did you say we, Excuse me? Betty. Um, so we, we are, we're fully in to, to make that transition. We're accepting um, uh, the, 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 the challenge. And I believe that we can do a little bit more. Uh, I mean, it's not only that we're 100% committed, but we as a company, we have to accept the responsibility and um, to be part of that change, to bring uh, the guidance, to bring uh, the articulated uh, value propositions to describe uh, the impact that our technology can deliver in a way that it's clear, that it's comprehensive, in a way that we can uh, guide the path for set no regulatory frameworks for the biosolutions, a parallel path that still fulfills its purpose. It still protects the safety. It still protects the society. It still protects the nature. 
but it decoupled from our paradigm of fossil based, and then we can move faster. And I think it's possible. We have one very clear example that shows that we can do it. When uh, we, as a society, as a human beings, we rally to one common case. Just look at what we've done with COVID. If there is one, if there is one good thing about COVID, is how we can rally together, change the paradigm, and towards one clear purpose, which was bring the vaccination faster, change the paradigm of regulation, and enable it without compromising on the quality of the solutions, an answer that the society needs. So Fantastic. I'm excited of being part of the journey, but I know it's a long journey. So we have to go there by one step after the other. Thank you so much, Essa. And I think earlier somebody was just agreeing with you. So um, that's always uh, a good sign in a panel like I, this. I, I could, I, sorry, I could not hear you very well. So thank that's you. That's okay. That's okay. Um, you know, I'm hearing, of course, some common themes um, that, that are really consistent, actually, with some of the goals of this session, um, which is really to bring... Um, you know, public and private together and, and to establish some opportunities where the private sector can fill um, some of the gaps. Um, and so I just like to, because, you know, we're going to be going into the uh, more informal part of the session in just a couple of minutes. Um, before we do so, I'd like to ask the Deputy Prime Minister, Teresa Rivera, if um, you could just quickly, and I'm gonna ask everyone to do this in about a minute or less, um, please tell us where you see potentially some greater opportunities between the private and the public sectors to accelerate the green transition. Um, perhaps you might want to talk with that a little bit um, in the context of, of some of the sectors that you are perhaps focusing on and targeting for investment in your own country, um, or perhaps also in the context of, you know, um, ways to utilize, for example, COP26 that's coming up later this year. Well, this is too many issues for just one minute, but I will try to to to, um, to summarize some ideas. The first of them, uh, they need to think in the um, transformational pathway, uh, being pragmatic. So what uh, we know that it is at reach today so that people can experience, uh, experience the success of um, the transformation and um, facilitating what, uh, what it has to come next. And in that context, it's true that energy infrastructures um, is a good field to find ourselves together, uh, public and private, and private, or as, uh, as it was also commented when working with uh, farmers and uh, a, um, the recovery of ecosystems, there may be some rooms of improvement where there may be some chemical services uh, or a water industry that uh, can be pretty, pretty uh, interesting in terms of combining the two things in the mid and long run. Um, it is interesting to find out what about the most innovative approaches. I was talking of storage or green hydrogen. And in terms of instrumental, it is very important to uh, ensure that uh, the finance industry uh, has easy tools available to bridge what we've got with what we need. Uh, for the COP, I could say that uh, we need to be very, how to say, aggressive and convincing. And I think that we are hearing very interesting uh, suggestions coming on how to accelerate the energy signals, how to accelerate the finance signals, how to accelerate uh, the, um, the, uh, the fields that uh, people take care of, so food security, soils and agriculture. So I think that uh, the packet should be balanced, should be quite ambitious and quite consistent. And the message is coming in, in very strong bold and consistent manners would be very, very important to push this agenda forward at the right speed in the domestic and the international dimensions. Deputy Prime Minister, thank you so much for that. Um, Liam, I'd like to turn to you next. What more would you like to see from your peers? One minute or less. Yeah, sure. So let me stay as concrete as possible and stay on the topic of, of the European Carbon Farming Coalition. I think beyond private uh, companies, industry, um, there's three areas where we can enhance collaboration. Uh, one is, of course, on the political side. Um, for this um, uh, uh, to be successful, this coalition to be successful, there has to be an adequate regulatory framework. So, so I think here it's essential that we have this public element of collaboration. Second area is uh, collaboration with academia because whatever we're doing, we have to be making sure that it's a science-based approach. 
and that the approach is uh, something that can be objectively verified. And, and here, I think academia uh, can ensure that we're, we're, we're working to the highest uh, degrees of, of rigor as possible. And the third one, I'd say, is NGOs. Um, I, I think whenever you get a coalition together, and particularly if private industry is involved, there's always a question of whether or not this is only going to benefit at the companies involved. And we've got to make sure that this is an inclusive approach, that it's not only good for companies who are involved, but it's got to be good for consumers and it's got to be good for the planet. So this is where I see a, a tremendous opportunity for a broader based coalition beyond private industry. Liam, thank you so much. Esther, over to you. Um, what would you like to see? One minute or less. I would like to see more of, of, what, I'm, of what I'm hearing and I would like to see it consistently mm -hmm moving in that direction. Listen, the, the Green Deal is a huge opportunity. It's, it's a call for action for the companies and we are ready. We're ready to step up and take the challenge. Um, but we need to stay firm on that direction. We have a very clear target. That's not changing. We simply need to continue to stay aligned, work in a collaborative approach, but then also uh, don't underestimate the value of the small steps. Make it much faster, much easier to accelerate the changes so we can accelerate the changes. I think uh, Europe has an opportunity to become the driver of change, to become the leader of change in the world. We have mm -hmm. the technology, we have the paradigm, we have the network, we have the, uh, the consumers also appreciation. And I think this is a change that we cannot miss. Thank you so much, Esther. Um, we have joining us also today, I have to mention, um, the co-chair of the CEO Action Group. I mentioned the CEO Action Group a little bit earlier. He also is the CEO of AXA, Thomas Bubel. And I'd just like to, before we enter the more informal um, part of our session, um, which is really action-oriented with, with the many stakeholders um, and executives that we have joining us um, in this session, Thomas, I'd like to ask you first, uh, you know, for your impressions of what you have been hearing, um, we had been hoped to have been joined by the executive vice president uh, of the commission, Timmermans. Um, we've been trying to connect with him. There are apparently some technical issues, but we know that, you know, um, CEOs such as yourself met with him last year in Davos. There was a big conversation about, you know, what the private sector could do to help the commission with this goal of, of, of you know, becoming climate neutral by 2050 um, and accelerating action. Um, and that there are a lot of gaps to fill. So perhaps, perhaps you can tell us, you know, what progress has been made over the past year, um, how you see the momentum right now, and where you would like to see greater action, perhaps from some of the people who might be on this call right now. Thank you, Sarah. Yes. And uh, despite the fact uh, that the uh, European Commissioner is not with us today, but he's certainly with us in spirit, and I'll show later on uh, also what has happened uh, uh, during that year. First of all, I'm very delighted uh, that we gather here today uh, to really talk about uh, this very central issue. How can we improve the collaboration and the cooperation between the private sector and the public sector to really find the right and pragmatic um, response to this massive climate challenge? On behalf of uh, FICA, with whom uh, I co-chair the CEO Action Group, um, I really would like to thank all the members again, and uh, Liam has uh, perfectly illustrated it. There are some very concrete uh, lighthouse projects uh, with which, uh, in which we work together, try and uh, really rally the members. Um, it is clear this is only a start. Uh, we wish, as Liam pointed out, um, to have far more people on board. And I think that will certainly uh, going to happen. And uh, what we've also heard today, which was very much uh, in the spirit of the beginning of this initiative, how can we make sure that uh, the climate challenge is tackled uh, hand in hand with the economic recovery program uh, post-COVID. Uh, the notion of building back better was very much uh, at the beginning and throughout uh, of all of discussion. And um, we started this discussion with the uh, European Commission, with Franz Termans, about a year ago in Davos. We were uh, still uh, together physically, uh, but there was a lot of uh, engagement from both sides. And I would really like to thank, again, the European Commission for this continued engagement and uh, the big support um, that they have given us. Um, the private sector uh, is fully ready to take this challenge and will certainly uh, take part in that challenge. But I do believe, and uh, going back to what you said, Sarah, 
there are uh, some needs uh, that uh, are required from the uh, public authorities in order uh, to move really forward. And some of them have already been mentioned. And for me, there is uh, four, four things that are important. Number one is clearly uh, the support. Um, we have heard this in this session a lot, but uh, obviously when you go further down uh, and you look at the implementation of projects, um, sometimes uh, it uh, takes a long time. Uh, uh, it is not as pragmatic as we always wish to have it. And certainly when you look at um, when are the recovery programs really getting operational, uh, there is still uh, a lot of time uh, to be gained to be fast. The second one for me is around uh, clarity. Clarity around um, what is uh, this uh, green transition, in particular when you come to the transition part and you look at, uh, I would say, the olive-colored sources of energy, uh, for example, nuclear, for example, gas. We need clarity around that and uh, the taxonomy um, that is now uh, moving in the right direction will give us an important uh, piece of that. But the clarity is not only on a European level to be achieved, it is also to be achieved internationally because we don't want to find ourselves um, later on confronted with a, a sector-specific uh, requirement and with a, a then a geographically different requirement and standard. This would be very, very, very difficult to implement. And then certainly when we look at the third point, which is very much around the incentives. Um, Liam mentioned uh, the example of the farmers. The incentives today need to be looked at, to my mind, across the entire value, value chain. And Teresa uh, mentioned that we look a lot at the energy sector, but we need to look at it uh, along the entire value chain. And for me, the fourth piece is really around uh, a standardized, and it should be underlined, standardized uh, science-based metrics. Today, we have an inflation of metrics. It's very difficult uh, how to orient yourself, and um, we need to make sure that together we come to a simple, explainable measure that we can all uh, orient uh, ourselves towards. But I'm very grateful uh, for the support, very grateful for the uh, progress that we have achieved. Um, and there is a lot of energy in the group, as you've seen beforehand, to really continue this journey and embark as many companies uh, as we can and as we need to, to really uh, tackle this challenge. So thank you very much, Sarah, again. Thank you very much, Thomas Google. Um, 